Sister Claire Crockett, servant sister of the Home of the Mother, alone with Christ alone. Chapter 22, Anything and Everything for Mary. Hermanita Clare, Hermanita Clare, the children shouted as Sister Clare walked quickly towards the house. It was her turn to make lunch and she wanted to start peeling some of the potatoes between classes. Recess had just started at the Holy Family Educational Centre in Playa Prieta, Ecuador. As she passed by, the youngest students grabbed her white scapular from behind, while others asked her if they could help carry her notebooks or markers. When they arrived at the house, she entered the chapel with them. Now, she opened her eyes wide and looked at each child. Listen closely. You have an amazing opportunity. You can spend a few minutes with God. Tell him anything you want. He is listening to you. If you really stay quiet and close your eyes, he will hear you. She then looked towards the tabernacle and entrusted them to our Lord with a wink. As she walked out of the chapel, she asked Sister Merley, who was working nearby, to keep an eye on them. She then raced upstairs, skipping every other step. There was no time to be wasted. The four-storey building had the school chapel on the bottom floor, some classrooms on the second floor, and the sister's house on the third floor. The fourth floor was a small apartment sometimes used to accommodate volunteers and missionaries. Sister Merley peeked into the chapel every few minutes to observe the little ones, who had their hands folded in prayer and their eyes closed. What had Sister Clare told them to keep the little students so quiet? Soon Sister Clare was back and she asked, did they behave well? Not a single peep, Sister Merley affirmed with surprise. That's what I like to hear, Sister Clare smiled as she proceeded to the front of the chapel to sing a song to Our Lady with the children before heading back to the patio with them. In spite of the name of the town, Playa, in Spanish means beach, there is no beach in the vicinity of Playa Prieta. A small muddy river passes through the rural area that is full of palm and various fruit trees. The Servant Sisters founded a community in Playa Prieta, Manabí in 2006 to take over the direction of an elementary and middle school in the area at the request of the then Archbishop of Porto Viejo, José Mario Ruiz Navas. Although the school seemed to be at the point of closing down, with much effort and trust in God's providence, the sisters managed to put order in the school and named it Holy Family Educational Centre. A few years before Sister Claire arrived, the sisters had added a high school to the educational centre, allowing the students to continue on campus until their preparations for university studies. Holy Family Educational Centre has an extremely low tuition so as to facilitate the attendance of students from poor families. Even so, many are given scholarships to pay the monthly tuition of $20. Sister Claire arrived on October the 20th, 2014, right after the midterm break. The school had around 400 students at the time, aged 3 to 18. Sister Claire wrote to Mother Anna a few months later, here in Playa Prieta, everything is going well, thanks be to God. I am very happy. Please pray for me so that through my relationship with Jesus, I can bring the children, young people and all the people he puts on my path closer to him. Sister Claire took on all of Sister Ruth Maria's lessons, English classes for all ages and religion class for the high school students, a full schedule like always. Shortly after her arrival, the community of sisters was listening to an audiobook about the life of St. John Paul II during the meals in silence. She wrote about how much this book helped her. In the morning, we are listening to an audiobook about St. John Paul II, and there was a story that helped me a lot and is still helping me. On one of his trips, there was a day of hustle and bustle, coming and going, etc. Joaquin Navarro Valls asked the Holy Father, are you tired? And the Holy Father simply responded, I don't know. He had forgotten about himself to such a point that he didn't even know whether he was tired or not. During prayer, the Lord permitted me to see that this is where true holiness lies, in always forgetting about myself, in not thinking about myself or about how I feel. I told the Lord that in reality, I do realise if I am tired or hungry or whatever. I may not be able to respond like John Paul II, but I can truly say that it doesn't matter how I feel. It doesn't matter if I am tired. It doesn't matter if I like a certain activity. It doesn't matter. 
I have to give of myself always with joy and enthusiasm. The Lord asks this of me. At 7.30am, the children arrived in the patio and formed lines by grade to begin the day together with a prayer. The high school students went to the chapel for a time of prayer before the Blessed Sacrament. Sister Claire always went to the chapel to begin and end the high school prayer time with a song on the guitar. She then went running off to class. As in Guayaquil, the guitar was an essential part of her classes. On the very first day of English class with the 12th graders, she began by saying, where there's a will, there's a way. In general, the students were resigned to studying English as an obligation, convinced they would never actually use it. Sister Claire did everything possible to motivate them. One young woman remembers, we didn't want the class to finish. And another, my classmates could be angry with many other teachers, but never with Sister Claire. The tutor of each class was a teacher in charge of keeping contact with the parents, receiving the grades of the students and helping each student personally when necessary. Sister Claire was named the tutor of ninth grade. Shortly after her arrival, the Olympics were about to begin, a school-wide soccer tournament. Each class had a team name and banner. The ninth graders had already decided their name with Sister Ruth Maria, the rebellious saints, although Sister Claire protested at first. She finally decided to leave the name, adding just one condition. Okay, you can be the rebellious saints, but at the same time, you are going to be my chickens and I will be the mother hen. Every time they arrived for a game, Sister Claire as the tutor walked first and they all followed behind, clucking and waving their elbows like chickens. Quite a few had to heroically overcome their embarrassment to participate, but they all did it. The students spontaneously added a drawing of a few chickens and a hen to their poster with the name The Rebellious Saints. As they played, Sister Claire would stand to the side and shout, Come on, little chickens, you can do it. The next morning, some students from an older class snuck into Sister Claire's classroom before a game and drew a gallows with a chicken hanging from it. Sister Claire responded later by entering their classroom and pecking at the students as if she were a hen defending her chicks. The harmless pranks continued. From that week onward, her class would always be known as Sister Claire's Chickens. If the other teachers were worried about one of the ninth graders, they would speak with Sister Claire and say, Sister, your chicken hasn't handed in any homework in over a week. Or if your chicken doesn't pass this quiz, I'm going to have to fail him. Sister Claire would always do her best to defend her chickens. But when she arrived in the classroom, she would tell them, Look, I defended you and told her that you would improve, but now you can't let me down. You better study and pass this test. Her chickens, of course, were typical adolescents. The world was beginning to open up to them and they had fallen into many of its traps. She perceived this immediately and her greatest desire was to help her little chickens understand that God alone could satisfy their desire for happiness. One day during lunch with the sisters, when exam time was approaching, Sister Claire expressed her concern. They have received so many opportunities. I don't know why they are not responding. Perhaps I need to do a novena and offer more sacrifices for them. She also came up with a new idea. She could promise to take them on a trip if they all passed the exams. She started looking at possible places to visit and discovered that the shrine of St. Narcissa of Jesus, an Ecuadorian saint, was just three hours away. When she announced this trip to the students and the conditions, she told them that she would be willing to overlook one or two exams. She knew that it was nearly impossible for all of them to pass their mathematics exam, even if they tried their hardest. Although some were not thrilled about the idea of going on a pilgrimage to see a saint as their class trip, Sister Claire was so enthusiastic about it that soon all of them were looking forward to the event. Sister Claire was convinced the trip would kill two birds with one stone. It would motivate them to study and pass their exams. And once they were on the trip, our Lord would pour forth graces and aid for their spiritual life. The students studied hard and managed to pass almost all their exams. So they were able to go on the pilgrimage with Sister Claire. It was just a one day trip, but it had a strong impact on these young students. She shared her vocation story with them, along with other funny stories, such as when she pretended she had a leprechaun and brought him to school with her. They started to open up to Sister Claire even more, telling her about their difficulties and seeking guidance. Many of them went home with sincere desires to change their lives and leave behind their sins. There was one other crucial moment during the year and a half she spent with them. 
Her chickens had fallen into the trap of gossip. What hurt Sister Claire most was their hypocrisy. They said one thing in front of the sisters and another before their classmates. She was clearly angry when she entered the classroom the day she found out. They had never seen her like that before. What most shocked them was to see her disappointment. As she corrected them, tears flowed from her eyes. When she noted that there was no sign of remorse during the next three days, there were no jokes or songs in class. She just looked at the book and explained the lesson. There was a young girl named Valeria in that class whose deepest desire was to become a servant sister. Valeria could not hold back her own tears when she saw Sister Claire cry as she corrected the class. The sensitive young girl approached Sister Claire and asked what she could do. Sister Claire, who knew well that Valeria had not participated in the gossip, said to her, pray for your classmates. That is the only thing you can do. Valeria, who reminded the sisters of St. Dominic Savio, asked for permission to offer the sacrifice of wearing her jacket during school hours, in spite of the terrible heat, as a sacrifice for her companions. Perhaps much of the fruit of Sister Claire's work with her little chickens was thanks to Valeria's prayers and sacrifices. It did not take long for the entire class to come together and ask for forgiveness. Sister Claire's chickens were not the only difficult students on campus. The eighth graders were also very irresponsible in their studies. They tried to boycott the classes by talking among themselves or even asking the teachers impertinent questions one after another. When Sister Claire was asked how she maintained control with the ninth grade class, she responded, I don't know. I just remember what Our Lady said to St. John Bosco, not with blows, but with gentle love. If you speak the truth with love, they will always respond to what you are asking. Sister Merle Alcivar, their tutor, once asked Sister Claire to give them a second opportunity on an English exam. Sister Claire responded, I've already given them another chance. I told them that I would sacrifice my break and be available to reinforce the lesson and answer their questions. And who showed up? Just one student. They've already had their chance. She wanted them to learn, but she also wanted them to mature. If they refused to take advantage of the opportunities she gave them, they had to assume the consequences. One day she came up with an idea. Why don't we start a choir here at the school? A lot of our students sing very well. She explained that the choir could prepare songs for the weekly school mass. The kids would do something constructive during recess and at the same time avoid getting so dirty and sweaty. She went around the classes announcing, We're going to start a choir. The tryouts will be next Friday during recess in the assembly hall. She never would have expected a third of the school to show up to the tryouts. Sister Merle was in the school office and saw a group of five children pass by the window toward the hall. Then she saw two more, then ten more. Where are they all going? When she realised all those kids were heading towards the tryout, she hurried over to see if Sister Claire needed help. Sister Claire was up on the simple stage, surrounded by over a hundred excited children, trying to organise them. The high voices over here and the low, low voices here, she shouted. Amidst all the confusion, Sister Claire kept an eye on a little blind boy who wanted to be a part of the choir. Your task is going to be to hold my papers. It's an extremely important job. And there he was, holding the papers, proud to help Sister Claire as she continued in her attempt to arrange the choir. Realising that it would be impossible to divide them into sopranos or altos, she ended up just lining them up by heights, as if the taller children were the sopranos and the shorter children were altos. That was the best she could do that first day. As the practices continued, however, only the more dedicated students persevered and the choir became more serious. When Sister Claire walked around the patio during recess, a 14-year-old boy with intellectual disabilities could often be seen following right behind her. She spent time listening to him patiently as he told her how his day was going, almost always repeating the same things he had said the day before. Sister Claire was also demanding when necessary. If he complained, my classmates stole my notebook. She would look at him seriously and say, but what did you do to them before that? And he would lower his gaze and admit that he had not behaved well. He loved playing the guitar and signed up for the guitar classes that Sister Claire organised during a time for the students. Some of the older students would help her as she patiently taught each child to form the chords correctly. The sisters normally had time to prepare classes and grade homework or exams in the afternoons. 
Sister Claire was very organised and responsible, always delivering her class's marks to the corresponding tutors on time. She wrote personal comments on each quiz or exam to give her students tips on how to improve or to encourage them to continue in their efforts. Despite the extra time employed in her personalised comments, she somehow managed to grade very quickly. She was always available for whatever the superior needed at any given moment. She also constantly did favours for the sisters when she saw an opportunity. Although she personally would always take all her books with her at the beginning of the day to avoid going up and down the stairs, she did not hesitate to go running up the stairs if she realised that another sister had left something behind. The others often did not even have time to react, and Sister Claire was already up the first flight of stairs to retrieve whatever was needed. A numerous group of girls at the school belonged to the youth group of the home of the mother. The girls had a series of commitments in their spiritual life, such as prayer, spiritual reading and spiritual direction. Some of them would jump in the back of the sisters' pickup truck to join them for daily mass in Porto Viejo. After a retreat in November of 2013, a handful of these young girls gave a special name to their group, H-M-Y-P-E-P, the initials in Spanish of Home of the Mother, I Prefer Paradise. In Porto Viejo, there was also a Home of the Mother residence for university students, some of whom were alumni of the sisters' school in Playa Prieta. A few candidates lived and studied in the residence in Porto Viejo and would come to Playa Prieto with the sisters on the weekends. On Sundays, the Resi girls would have their formation meeting with the sisters, followed by a soccer match. Sister Claire always played with them. Her love for soccer seems to have started during her year in Belmonte back in 2012. She was very competitive, though always in a joking manner. On one occasion, right as it seemed that the other team would win, Sister Claire fell to the ground, wincing and grabbing her ankle. The girls and sisters started laughing, assuming it was just a scene. Sister Claire called out laughing, isn't anyone going to help me? She had really sprained her ankle and it was starting to swell. It was the same ankle she had sprained three years before, in the summer of 2012, before going to Ecuador. After some rest, her ankle improved, but it never fully recovered. Sister Claire soon started playing soccer again. She would say to the sisters, even though it hurts, I am still going to play. The game was simply not the same for the girls if the sisters did not participate. For the Feast of the Epiphany in 2016, the girls asked the sisters to write a letter to the three wise men to ask them for gifts, as is traditional in some Spanish-speaking countries. In addition to other things, Sister Claire asked for batteries so that I do not get tired when I play soccer. On the weekends, the community of servant sisters helped the parish priest with catechism classes and taking Holy Communion to the sick and elderly of the area. In this email to Mother Anna, Sister Claire shares her reflections on this apostolate. We bring communion to an elderly woman who is 105 years old. She lives in a bamboo house and doesn't have nearly anything. She cannot walk without the help of two sticks that she uses as her crutches. The floor of her house is also made of bamboo and is full of holes. The other day when I was with her, she said, Madrasita, the first thing I do when I open my eyes in the morning is make the sign of the cross and give thanks to God for a new day. I almost started crying. She is all alone all day long and cannot even move, but you always find her smiling and giving thanks to God. This and another story that I read the other day while preparing religion class for the 10th graders have been like a kick in the butt for me. Pliny the Younger, Roman governor in Bithynia in the year 112, wrote a letter to the emperor about the Christians who denied offering sacrifices to the emperor, saying, They were accustomed to meet before dawn and sing hymns to their Christ. This made me think, how do I get up in the morning? How do I pray lords? Sometimes I have the sensation that the Lord makes things so easy for me and I don't make the best of time or of circumstances. All of these things help me to see how far I am from what I should be, and because of my excessive pride, I get discouraged. I know it's terrible. Pray for me. More than anything, Mother, it's hard for me to pay attention in Mass, and this also makes me suffer. After I receive communion, I simply rest my forehead on the heart of Jesus, like in the drawing the sisters gave me when I made my perpetual vows, and I ask him for forgiveness, and I ask for him to love in me. She would often repeat, you live your life as you live the Mass, and you live the Mass as you live your life. 
She was pained when she caught herself getting distracted in Mass. The Lord called her to make constant efforts to live the Mass better and to be united to him throughout the day, during Mass and outside of Mass. One day, as she was visiting different homes with Sister Sarah Maria Jimenez to bring the Eucharist to the sick, Sister Claire was carrying the picks in her hand with great care. Right when they were entering a home, however, it somehow slipped from her hand, fell to the ground and opened, and all the hosts were scattered in the dirt. Deeply distressed, Sister Claire knelt down immediately and recovered each host with great affection. The two sisters looked carefully to make sure no little particles remained, as Christ is entirely present in each little piece. With her eyes full of tears, Sister Claire kissed the ground where the hosts had fallen, covering her mouth with dirt. She seemed not to care that there was dirt on her face and lips when she got back on her feet, so Sister Sarah Maria helped to wipe it off her face. In the following houses, Sister Claire could not stop crying, so much so that Sister Sarah Maria had to give communion to the rest of the sick. As the tears fell from her eyes, Sister Claire whispered over and over, Why do you permit this, Lord? Why, Lord? She had dropped him, and he was her Lord and her God. Her zeal for our Lord was manifested on many occasions. Once she was praying in the cathedral after Mass, and a lady approached to try to sell her something. Sister Claire understood the situation of poverty in Ecuador. In Guayaquil, she had personal experience of selling things on the streets with the home of the mother girls to fundraise for activities or for the new house, and she knew how difficult it was for these street vendors. However, the church was not the proper place for this. At first, she calmly responded to the lady, I don't have any money, but I will pray for you. Frustrated by this pious response, the lady started shouting at Sister Claire, What shame! You're a nun and you should help me. Something changed in Sister Claire, and it seemed as if our Lord had said to her, Defend my house. She stood up and shouted, This is the house of God, a house of prayer. You can't sell things here and interrupt people who are praying. The scene reminded the sisters and girls present of our Lord as he cast the money changers out of the temple. My house shall be called a house of prayer. During her first year in Playa Prieta, the sisters heard that a family member of two students at the school was gravely ill. Although born Catholic, he rejected the church due to certain scandalous situations he had witnessed. He constantly blasphemed against God and could not stand hearing anything about religion. Although he normally treated the sisters with respect, he avoided them whenever possible. Upon hearing the news, Sister Claire immediately exclaimed, What are we waiting for? If he's going to die, we have to go. When they entered the house, the sick man immediately began to insult the sisters and asked them, What are you here for? He blasphemed and repeated over and over again, The devil, the devil. Sister Claire whispered to Sister Merley, The devil is here, pray. She took out a crucifix with a medal of St. Benedict and began to walk towards him, holding up the cross. When she saw that the sick man was looking at the crucified Lord, she said calmly and firmly, I am here because I want to help you. But if you want, I can leave. If you treat people like this, no one will want to help you. At this, he calmed down and listened silently. The sisters then began a normal conversation with him and asked him how he was doing. Without delay, however, they brought the conversation around to the faith and asked him if he wanted to put his soul in peace with God. He resisted. Nothing seemed to break through the wall he had built up between God and himself. Sister Claire started to ask him questions. But you used to go to Mass. You used to be an altar boy, weren't you? And you belonged to the Legion of Mary, right? The man began to cry and recognised that he had indeed belonged to the Legion of Mary and had prayed many rosaries. Sister Claire showed him a holy card of Our Lady and he began to cry even more. The two sisters started to pray the rosary and he prayed it with them. At the end, Sister Claire gave him a miraculous medal together with the holy card and pinned them on the mosquito net around his bed. I'm going to leave you here with Our Lady. The man continued to cry. She then added, And what would you say if I bring a priest to see you? She was hopeful he would accept and eventually go to confession. He responded, I don't know. Sister Claire laughed and said, OK, OK, we'll see what we can do. As they came out, she turned to Sister Merley. He didn't say no. That's a miracle. We have to bring a priest. They phoned a few priests, but they were not able to find anyone willing to attend the dying man. 
Sister Claire returned later that day and continued to help him to examine his conscience and ask our Lord for forgiveness for all his sins. He was a totally different person. He died shortly afterwards. His family later told the sisters that he had died with his gaze fixed on the holy card with Our Lady's image. He had asked his family to pin the miraculous medal on his shirt. In his last hours, he had requested, Pray the rosary, please. Help me to pray. Our Lady used Sister Claire as an instrument to rescue this lost sheep who had loved her so much when he was young. Throughout this year, our Lord spoke to Sister Claire in prayer and encouraged her to be generous and to love. Visible fruits like this were definitely an encouragement, but she saw her own self so in need of God's mercy that our Lord had to send her reminders of his aid. In December of 2014, she wrote to Mother Anna, One day during prayer, I felt that the Lord encouraged me by saying that if I continued trying, he would never withdraw his grace. It's something that I already know. But when the Lord says it in such a tender way, it gives me so much strength. Our Lord never ceased to give her grace to begin anew, to persevere despite the difficulties. She was always attentive to what he wanted to say to her through the books she was reading, through circumstances and events in her life, through the little things. He spoke to her very clearly about the importance of obedience in her first year in Playa Prieta. I think that one of the biggest graces I received during Lent was something I read from an excellent book by Scott Hahn, Lord Have Mercy. He writes, What was required of Adam and Eve was a sheer act of will, uniting their own will with God's will, and thus sacrificing all the lower desires of their bodies and souls, hearts and minds. This along with something that Jesus told Sister Josepha Menendez filled me with so much joy. Obedience is the veil under which you should disappear. I experienced that through obedience, when I do God's will, I am truly and authentically free. In every act of obedience, the Lord asks me the same thing he asked Adam and Eve, to unite my will to his and sacrifice the lowest desires in me in order to make my heart grow. Obviously, there are acts of of obedience that are hard for me, but I understand they are always for my own good. If I want to put on the mind of Christ, I have to disappear. Which acts of obedience were difficult for her? Perhaps one of the hardest continued to be that of getting up early in the morning. In another email, she writes, I have to admit that it is very hard for me to get up in the morning at the time we get up here, 5 a.m., especially when there's no school and we get up at the same time. It is a small or big nightmare. During the month of May, we pray the rosary at dawn, very early in the morning, that is at 5 a.m., The first rosary we prayed on May the 1st coincided with First Friday. Since we have adoration turns during the night on Thursday and then we were going to have to wake up before 5 a.m. to pray the rosary, Sister Estella didn't know if we were going to go to the rosary or not. She asked us, shall we go? From the bottom of my heart, I spontaneously exclaimed, of course. How were we not going to make this sacrifice for the Virgin? Anything for her. In that moment, I heard the unmistakable voice of the Lord say to me, My daughter, why don't you have the same attitude when I call you through obedience to get up every morning? You are willing to make this sacrifice for my mother, but are you not willing to make this sacrifice for me, your God, if I ask you to do so until your very last day here on earth? I was left without words. The following day on Saturday, there were no classes and no processions, and yet the community still woke up at 5 a.m. She wrote, I got up very, very angry. As they began adoration before the Blessed Sacrament, she was still upset. The superior read the Mass readings of the day, as we always do at the beginning of prayer in the morning. This sentence from the Gospel stood out to Sister Claire. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do. She made the effort to ask our Lord for the grace of conversion, in spite of the angry feelings she still experienced. To calm myself down, I picked up the book of spiritual combat, looking for strength, peace and light. As soon as I opened it, I read a sentence that helped me. Ad maiora nati sumus. We were born for much higher actions. Jesus, it is so hard for me to die. It is so hard for me to die. She later wrote to Mother Anna and Father Raphael the explanation of this sentence and how it helped her. It's a phrase that the first Christians would say when they wanted to cast away with a magnanimous expression, something that seemed mediocre, vulgar or petty. I was born for greater things. Why did this help me so much? 
because in prayer I understood that everything that I do, especially getting up at five in the morning, has to become a sacrifice of praise. I have to elevate this act so that it is hard for me into something great. God asks me for this sacrifice because he will do something great with it. I finish prayer with this certainty, ad majora nata sum. The Lord was asking great things of her. Sister Claire's love for the Virgin Mary also motivated her to do great things, as we have seen on more than one occasion. During her time in Ecuador, she grew in her love for her Heavenly Mother in Cayas. The sisters in Ecuador had discovered this shrine to Our Lady, the Guardian of the Faith, in 2013. It was located in the Andes, in a national park called Cayas, province of Azue. The Bishop of Ambato authorised the construction of the Shrine of the Garden of Cayas in 2002. A simple wooden chapel was built next to the statue of the Guardian of the Faith, elevated upon a rock. Sister Claire visited the shrine for the first time when she was in the community of Guayaquil in February of 2014. On that occasion, she experienced that Our Lady interceded to request for her an increase of faith. Later, from Playa Prieta, she was able to visit the shrine on several occasions. The home of the mother girls in Playa Prieta had already received many graces in Cayas before Sister Claire's arrival. In February of 2014, Sister Estella Morales, superior in Playa Prieta, had written a poem for the girls entitled I Prefer Paradise, the name they had chosen for their group. She gave them each a copy of the poem with a picture of Our Lady, Guardian of the Faith. Sister Claire later put music to this poem and it became a very important song for all the girls. The music just came to her. The first night she sang it for the girls, they asked her to sing it over and over again. They would continue to ask her to play it on every possible occasion. Sister Claire described the song in these words. Sometimes when Our Lady or Our Lord gives you a grace, it's hard to respond to what they ask of you out of fear. That's what the song's about. Sister Estella wrote the poem as an expression of the girls' experiences in Cayas. They were afraid to say their yes to Our Lord. Yet, with the presence of Our Lady, they found strength to overcome that fear and to respond generously to the graces received, preferring heaven over the things of this world. Here are the lyrics. In the cold night of the dormant soul, who laments her defiance, a yes enlightens the darkness. The young heart that trembled in the face of surrender became strong at the touch of your caress. And morning came clearer than ever before under the protection of a mother, guardian of the faith, on the sacred grounds where a heart bows down, trembling in love and offering her life. Now everything has changed, haven of peace, innocent joy. Finally, they have given what their God was asking. I prefer paradise was the cry from within, the fear was lost, the fear to give, to surrender, to die so as to live. Our mother smiles and embraces her little ones in the silent valley where everything speaks of her. When Sister Claire arrived in Playa Prieta, she teased the girls about their exaggerated love for the Marian shrine. However, just two weeks after her arrival in Playa Prieta, the sisters organised a surprise trip to Cayas for the girls. It was then that Sister Claire herself had a very strong experience of Our Lady's presence. After a moment of prayer, she went up to the girls glowing with joy and with a mysterious air to her. The girls smirked and asked her, Do you now understand why we are crazy about Our Lady in Cayas? Sister Claire replied affirmatively and they all started laughing for joy. As they were getting up to leave, Sister Claire exclaimed, We can't go without singing one final song to Our Lady. Her heart was so full of thanksgiving to her Heavenly Mother that she started singing with all her might, Thank you, thank you, thank you. The sisters and girls always knew from that moment on that whenever they heard Sister Claire start this song, it was directed to Our Lady. As they were walking away, Sister Claire looked back towards her Heavenly Mother and cried out, Guapa, which means, You're beautiful. There were other people present, but Sister Claire didn't mind. Human respect was not going to keep her back from showing her love. The ride there and back was also an occasion for apostolate. She explained how she reached out to the girls in an email to Father Raphael. Normally on the pilgrimages, Father, I grab the guitar, go to the front to sing with the girls, tell stories and try to liven up the bus ride. I also try to sit with all the girls. I don't have a specific spot. I go around talking with everyone. 
On one pilgrimage, one of the sisters from another community approached her and said, Sister Claire, remember, you have to give class on Monday when you return to Playa Prieta. Maybe you should stop singing and save your voice for class. Sister Claire had been singing for several hours and her voice was so hoarse that she could not reach some of the notes of the songs she sang. Sister Claire responded without hesitation. It doesn't matter, Sister. Our Lord is asking me to do this and I can't not do it. She was certain of what the Lord asked of her in the present moment and trusted fully that he would give her the voice for the next activity if he needed her then. The sisters noticed that on certain occasions her voice seemed to suddenly improve when the need arose. Kayas is at a height of 3,500 metres, 11,482 feet above sea level. The sudden change in altitude during the bus trip often causes altitude sickness with symptoms such as dizziness, headaches, stomach pain and shortness of breath. Sister Claire was no exception. Although she sometimes had to go to the front to recover, she normally tried her hardest to continue singing and doing apostolate. Sister Karen accompanied Father Raphael and Mother Anna on a trip to Ecuador in April of 2015. She was edified by Sister Claire's attitude of generosity and selflessness throughout the pilgrimage to the Shrine of Our Lady in Cayas. Despite Sister Claire's efforts to hide the fact that she was feeling unwell, Sister Karen, who knew her very well, could tell that Sister Claire had a bad headache and nausea throughout the trip. Nevertheless, she transmitted joy and love to the girls through her conversations and the songs she sang for hours on end. When they arrived, after saying goodbye to the girls, Sister Claire entered the sister's house, put the guitar in a corner and slumped into a chair, obviously at the end of her strength. Father Raphael, who was also utterly exhausted after the fast-paced pilgrimage, looked at Sister Claire approvingly and remarked, the things we do for the love of souls. Sister Claire lifted her gaze towards her spiritual father and managed to reply, Yes, Father. Sister Karen had the impression of being in the presence of two great souls. As Sister Claire signed an email to Father Raphael back in 2013, long live the magnanimous souls that seek only God's glory. On another occasion, on the eve of the Feast of Pentecost, the sisters spent the entire night in vigilant prayer before Our Lady in Caias, asking her intercession to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The sisters in Spain were doing the same in Garabandal. Sister Claire wrote to Our Lady. In tonight's vigil, Mama, I ask to never, ever lose you. I have you and I lose you. I have you and I lose you. I don't want to lose you ever again. I am not asking for something on an emotional level. I am not asking to feel you. I am asking to have you always, to be in you always. I should lose myself in order to find myself in you. I ask you to grant me this grace and that all of my insignificant trivialities become lost in second place and that you, with your astonishing realities, take the first place. And after the trip, she wrote to Father Raphael and Mother Anna, on Sunday afternoon, we got back from being with the Virgin in Caias. We spent the night with her and with Jesus for the vigil of Pentecost. It was very cold, but that didn't matter. Just being with her and having the desire to see her happy made you almost not feel the cold. You know what I mean? Before returning to Porto Viejo, several of us experienced that our mother thanked us for the effort we had made. When she experienced that Our Lady thanked them for their efforts, she wanted to thank Our Lady in return for everything she had given them, even though Sister Claire had been leading the sisters and girls in song all night. Her heart was so full of thanksgiving to her Heavenly Mother that she started singing once again, though with a very hoarse voice, Thank you, thank you, thank you. She was truly willing to do anything for the Virgin Mary, anything and everything for her, even giving up an entire night of sleep. It was so little in comparison to all that our Blessed Mother constantly gave her. Mm -hmm.